Hello and welcome to the Rogue Monkey Podcast. My name is Kevin Pickard. Our platform exists to share stories of those who are challenging convention, are often trailblazers in their own right, and ultimately aim to inspire others to do the same in their lives. I'm pleased to be able to share with you episode 47, which is the penultimate show of season 6. Over the last six weeks, we've spoken to activists, TV presenters, and lots of people from the world of sport who are forging their paths through the world. Continuing on that thread, I'm really pleased to share with you today our discussion with Alice Hewson, professional golfer on the Ladies European Tour. I've known Alice for quite a while now, and it's been awesome to watch her journey unfold. But what does that look like? How do you go from an age group swimmer to international golfer via a stint in America with the prestigious Tigers at Clemson University and become one of the first women to play at Augusta? Alice is such a passionate sports person and it really was a fun interview to record. So I hope you enjoy it as much as we did as we get into episode 47 of the Rogue Monkey podcast. Alice Hewson, exploring the journey to becoming a professional golfer. Hello, Alice. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thanks for taking some time to join us today. You're in sunny isolation in Hertfordshire, I gather, at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Awaiting a visa to head back to the sunny US, but we'll explore more of that as you go on. But um, if you can just give us a quick introduction as to who you are and kind of why you're joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Alice Hewson. I am a professional in the Ladies European Tour. I just finished my rookie year where I was able to win my first event on tour. So that was exciting. Um, hoping to get status on the LPG in the future. But as a background, um, I went to Clemson University in South Carolina, where I got an accounting degree um, and a minor in legal studies. So really enjoyed my time over there. I think that was really helpful. Um, my mum is a swimming coach. So I used to swim an awful lot as a kid. Um, went to nationals a few times, won a medal, made a lot of finals. So really enjoyed the swimming part of growing up. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Well, we've got plenty of things to unpick there. So I, I'm curious, <laughs> obviously, you weren't born with a golf club in your hands. But I mean, how early did you kind of pick up the sport of golf? Um, I first started kind of practicing and taking some group lessons when I was six. And my first competition was actually on my seventh birthday. (laughs) See, this is fascinating because obviously a lot of people talk about early specialization sports, maybe gymnastics or swimming or diving or whatever it is. Uh, And sometimes, you know, we almost forget there's quite a lot of other sports out there that you perhaps start really early on. So especially being a competitive swimmer and for anyone who knows you know competitive swimmers it's quite full on when you're young how did you balance doing golf and and swimming oh it was so hard I felt like I was on the go at all times um you know I was swimming up to eight times a week when I got to about 13 years old and trying to practice as well luckily I didn't do school sport I would take that time to practice my golf um so that was really helpful um it's definitely a challenge trying to juggle all of it. But, you know, the swimming fitness helped with the golf and vice versa. I was always on the go. That's pretty cool. And I think, you know, obviously at a young age, I'd imagine there's just probably not this ultimate goal of where it could end up or even a vision of where it might end up. But kind of at what point on that, those first few years, did you kind of think this, this could become something perhaps a little bit more than what it is now? Um, I always really enjoyed my golf and so kind of from a really young age I'd always thought wow it'd be really cool to be a professional golfer Um, and say like right around 13 or 14 was when I decided that that's what I wanted to do as my job Um, and it was at that point that I had to make the decision between my golf and my swimming Um, you know it there comes a point where there isn't enough time in the day to do both you need to kick the swimming on to be doing 24 30 hours a week and you need to be doing more in the on the golf course so um yeah it was about then that I kind of made my decision so let's just go back a little bit fast forward back to say 14 and then what what was training like for, from a golf point of view because you know I play golf but I, I'm nowhere professional so give us a bit of an insight into what that looks like from a training point of view um well I was still in full-time school and so as I say I was just kind of taking the time out of school sports to go and practice my golf so that was 
probably five or six hours out of the week like not really too much um and then on the weekends like those were my only real opportunities to do kind of golf specific stuff um I'd see my coaches an awful lot lessons of a weekend and then you know the summer's the best time as the nights get longer and you can start going out and playing a few hours after school um that really helped <laughs> Yeah, and I guess that's something that is a real challenge in this country from from a golf point of view. And I've had this discussion with a few people we've had on around winter sports. And actually, you know, there's only certain times of the year, if even if you live in the, the heights of Scotland, where you can actually do winter sports. And actually, this probably applies here. It's quite hard to go and play golf when it's an inch thick of snow or pouring with rain and, and waterlogged everywhere. Yeah, those conditions are not ideal. Um, happily playing the rain. I've had lessons in the snow before um just makes it a little bit more challenging yeah it's um it's curious can you remember any of like your early memories around competitions and some of the the experiences you had I guess pre-pro where you were still kind of in the school system was there was there any particular things that stand out for you uh well so the competition I played on my seventh birthday my first ever shot in competition actually completely missed the ball um (laughs) <laughs> so that was a really good start to my competitive career. Um, but, you know, things kind of just gradually improved. I played um, for the England team for the first time when I was 14. Um, we went up to the Scottish Under-16 Championships. The following year, I won that event. Um, I won the National Championships at age 12. Um, I think that kind of really kick-started my belief in myself. That's the first time I'd ever really come against other girls kind of my age from around the whole country um and so you know going to win that was a really great experience and gave me that confidence to go on to represent England represent Great Britain and Ireland and just have faith in my game so obviously there's you you going through the school system and by its very nature school kind of looks after itself you know year seven becomes year eight year nine becomes year ten so at what point then did you kind of start looking beyond the school gates, if you like, where you actually thought, right, what does the next steps look like if I'm going to take this on beyond the world of school? So we actually have some really, really good systems in place. Um, and when I was that 11 to 12 year old age group, I was in the county programs. They would have group training with the other girls and the other ladies within the county. Um, they'd bring in a coach and we'd kind of just create a an environment where we could all practice together and push each other so started that and progressed from the girls to the ladies um I got picked up and joined kind of regional England squads and then up to the full national level squad at age 14 um I think that's really really helpful kind of for the training and they help prepare you for that next step it's like, like those progressions are kind of like going from year seven to year eight to year nine. Um, they give you the training, they give you the knowledge and they help you move forward. And I was lucky enough to be one of the few who kind of started right at the very bottom and progressed through each level all the way up to getting my full England cap at, I think I was 17. So I guess it wasn't though a completely straight line from kind of missing the ball at seven years old through to <laughs> getting your first England cap. So Just, I guess, because we have lots of different people listening to this from different sports, one of the things that often resonates is this commonality that everyone has some hurdles to overcome. So can you kind of think of any along the way that you look back now and you think, yeah, actually, that's probably helped me on my journey? Hmm. I think kind of making that decision to um, hold back a little bit on the swimming and kind of go more in with the golf was definitely it was a really big decision at the time you know I never wanted to give up either of them especially not with my mum's history she owned her own swimming club so I definitely didn't want to give that up um but I think that was the only real main hurdle that I kind of came across I've come across some later on in life you know having to choose what university to go to and all of those things that you look back and they're actually really big decisions that didn't seem too big at the time. Um, but just kind of manoeuvred my way around and my family's been huge in trying to help me through all of that. Well, I, I want to kind of dive into that a little bit. Obviously we connected through, you know, your mum and as a swimming coach and I, I'm kind of curious as to the, how the family role has, has kind of factored in across this, because I'm sure at seven years old, you were probably getting driven to these golf courses <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> 
blagging that mum's going to be the caddy and all that sort of stuff. So what did the, oh, the yeah. fam, what did the family kind of uh, roles look like going through this sporting journey? Certainly pre uni, they've always played such a huge part in my golf, um, in everything, in my swimming. Um, whether it, as you say, whether it be kind of driving me everywhere or encouraging me to start playing golf to begin with. My dad's the whole reason I got into golf. Um, His side of the family has always played, and we're really lucky. We live about two minutes from the local golf course. So I was able to just go up with him um, while he was practicing, and I'd walk around and just kind of start off hitting a few putts here and there, and then started chipping, and then the group lessons. Um, But it's just nice knowing that I've got a group of people who only are ever going to want what's best for me. It's not about what other people think. It's not about always, you know, oh, this decision is going to be the absolute best move for your professional golf career. Like everything is about what's best for me as a whole. Um, And I think that's just really great. That's a great message. And I think too often we can get caught up in, you know, the stats or the sport or whatever it is around the actual non-human part of it and overlook the fact that actually it's a human being. It's a young girl growing and developing and finding her place in the world. And to have the confidence that your family are there for you as a human being first, it must have been a huge benefit along the way, I guess. Absolutely. Awesome. So you kind of, you've gone into the teenage years, you've gone full time per se with golf in terms of stepping away from the swimming. At what point did the whole concept of potentially going to America start to be a narrative for you? From quite a young age, I decided that I wanted to go over to America. I actually signed with an agency to help with that process. Um, And they're basically a group of people who have been through the American system themselves and have built contacts with all of the coaches at different schools, different programs, whether that be Division One or Division Three. Um, and I believe I signed with them around 15. Um, kind of got myself a profile together and just kind of got my name in front of some of the coaches in America. Um, and the journey kind of just went from there. I was lucky in the fact that I was playing for England regularly. So the coaches were able to actually come and watch me play in person, which is an opportunity that not many people get. So I was at a real advantage. And I believe that two years out from going to university, I got about 35 or 40 universities contact me interested in wanting me to go to their program. Um, and that's, that's a great feeling to feel wanted by that many different programs. Um, so it was then down to you know, me and the family to kind of whittle it down to the few that we wanted. And we decided that East Coast was going to be the better move for me, just because it's a little bit closer to home. We've always holidayed in Florida. So that's kind of an area that we would always be familiar with. Um, And then we flew out as a whole family and went and toured seven different universities. Um, I think that's a really, really important step in the process that a lot of people seem to overlook and I've found that a lot of people who do overlook that bit end up unhappy with where they chose and then end up switching universities um but it was it was a great process and it was the best decision I could have ever made to have gone to America I think it's really interesting when I talk to sports people that make these sorts of decisions because if you say to a child at the age of 12 you know what do you want to be and they say I want to be a doctor for example and then at 16 they choose their age or 15 they choose their A-levels and then they choose their degree and then their first day on the ward might not come until they're 22 or 23 (laughs) whereas you kind of picked up a golf club for a competition at the age of seven and then at the age of 15 people are saying hey do you want to do you want to really kind of step this on a gear and go out and live your dream in America you've probably been imagining that for kind of eight years leading up to it of that chance to go and do it full time absolutely yeah definitely so when and I'm only speaking really just from the the having such the supportive family bubble what was it like the first day when you got to America and it was kind of like drop the suitcases thanks and they went back to the airport what was that moment like so they actually came all the way over to America with me we'd spent a week in Florida beforehand before we went up um and they stayed right up until my first day of classes and they dropped me off at my first ever university class just like they'd done the rest of my life um and then they all went on a cruise 
because they were sad that they were leaving me. Um, but it was, I was so ready to get over. I committed to go to Clemson nearly two years before I actually went. So we'd had the opportunity to visit the campus six or seven times beforehand. I was really comfortable with my surroundings, my coaches, my team. And then I made it so much easier. And it had just become kind of me waiting to go over. I was so ready. Um, you know, I was having to do A-levels and then I had the summer and I just wanted to get over. So that first day, I'm sure, was a very different experience for me than it was for them because I was just so excited. It might have even been my birthday <laughs> or my birthday the next day or something. Um, so I was just kind of ready to get going um, and wave goodbye to them as they drove off back to Florida to go on their cruise. <laughs> One of the things as well that jumps out when I speak to people that have been through the American college system is when we view it externally, you know, you see the sport and, you know, the follow on professional leagues and all those sorts of things. But we, I think we overlook and miss a bit. And I know we just mentioned before we started recording the actual experience of going through the American system. So if you can just bring that to life a little bit, let's talk about, you know, what are your memories of that kind of first year there? Oh, my first year was incredible. Um, I actually won my first two events in college. So that was a great start golf wise, but just kind of getting to know the girls on the team um, and experience life in a different country. I had to wait six weeks before I could drive my car because, you know, I had to get a social security number and then I had to go and pass another driving test and I had to do all of these different things before I could drive. So I was completely reliant on my teammates to kind of help me through these first six weeks and I actually think that looking back that was the best thing that could have happened because I really got to know them properly by the time they're picking you up at 5 30 in the morning to go and work out and then driving you to the golf course later on that day you have a lot of car rides with these people um, and you just try to get get chatting with them um, but, you know, my experiences the whole way through were just incredible. I had to go from an environment where, you know, my mum helps me with my laundry and they're taking me everywhere to all of a sudden I have to schedule my own stuff. And it's my responsibility and no one's going to come and tell me to come and clean my bedroom or that I need to do laundry. And all of a sudden you've run out of stuff. Um, so just kind of that adjustment, I think, was really, really important for me in like my preparations for turning pro and living out on the road more. Um, but even just the basics of, you know, learning on what to pack each week and not forgetting every anything, making sure that you've got a mini medicine bag in your golf bag at all times in case you get a blister, like all of those small details that you'd never even think of before going over. I've just kind of picked up and learned from the other girls, from the coaches um, and can take it with me to life out on tour. I mean, you mentioned tour there, and obviously you must have had some incredible travel experiences as part of this. Were there any kind of standout trips or experiences you can remember that actually impacted on you beyond, you know, just the amazing golf courses? While in college or while on tour? Uh, well, anything so far. <laughs> um, we had some really cool experiences this year out on tour. We got to play in Dubai at night. So it was on a floodlit golf course um, and that was really exciting. But we also went to Saudi Arabia, which was um, a really new experience for everyone. I mean, they've never had a female golf event there before. So for us to be the first group of ladies competing over there was an exciting experience. Um, I've had a lot of firsts. I was in the first group of girls to have the opportunity to play at Augusta National. Um, I played the Augusta National Women's Amateur my senior year of college. So I believe that was 2019. Um, and I've just had so many really special experiences throughout my time at university um, with the England teams, with the Great Britain teams and now on tour. I find it a bit curious, again, coming from a traditionally individual sport such as swimming and a traditionally individual sport such as golf in terms of participation you've already used the word team and kind of support networks so much already so how has that I guess dispelled the myth that actually although these are individual sports it's definitely not something that you do on your own 
Absolutely not. And I think being in those team environments in England and at Clemson have then prepared me for realizing how many people I need around me for life on tour. You know, in England and in at Clemson, you've got a group of other girls who are also players. You know, they've got to look after their own needs too because you need them to play well for the team to do well. But we travel with coaches. We've got um, at Clemson, we've got academic help. Um, which is obviously a really big part of being a student athlete. Um, we've got medical people at hand all of the time. Just kind of everything that goes with it um, and learning what I need to be on tour. Like it's not just about me and my coach and my family anymore. It's trying to build a group of people around me to try and do the best that we can. I'm curious again, because you talk about the the student athlete thing and I think there's there's this this myth or this kind of ghoulish approach to saying, oh, you, you can't do both. You can't study and do sport. And actually, obviously, you're kind of living, breathing example that actually you can. So what are the kind of things that, that you've learned along the way that's helped you, I guess, manage that and balance that? I think that's one of the biggest differences between American university and staying over here to do university. Because I'd say, from what I can see, the British university system, you are there as a student. And you do your athletics on the side and it's kind of down to you to do a practice, to go to tournaments, like do whatever you need to do with your sport. And that would be exceptionally challenging. Whereas going over to America, it is truly an experience of being a student athlete. It is split 50-50. You have equal support in your athletic side as you do it in your student side. Um, not only did we have the kind of regular advisors at Clemson, we had specialist advisors that worked with individual teams to try and assist with planning schedules so that all the girls in the team could have um, classes on a Tuesday morning rather than all day on a Tuesday so that we could you know, get together and practice as a team in the afternoon. We had specialist buildings with tutors available to us at all times so that we, were, if we were struggling in a class, we were able to kind of go in and ask for specific help. Um, and, you know, I didn't require as much help as other people, but you've got teams with American football and with basketball. And so our advisors are there to help us keep on top of doing our assignments because when you're that busy, it's so easy to just let some things like fall through the net. And so they're there to be like, okay, have you done all your assignments for this week? Have you done this checklist of items? And just the whole generic support of everything that you do is there while you're in America. They can help you in every aspect that you need them to. And I feel that's quite a big difference than the experience you might get over here. And do you think that's almost then feels like not a weight off your mind, but that's that's really changed things since kind of going pro in the sense of now the academic stuff is that's something you can kind of go, well, that's out of the way. And actually all that time I was spending studying can be added as even more practice time or, or you know, building up potential commercial opportunities or appearances or, you know, doing other tour events. So has that kind of not been I say a weight off your mind, but I guess there must just be a change of lifestyle once you've finished academics. It's definitely been different. Yeah, I kind of didn't know how I would react to not being in school because it's all I'd ever known. Um, and I really enjoyed school. I enjoyed my studies and I enjoyed being at Clemson. So moving away from that, I was a little bit scared about what would happen. Um, but I've definitely thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> it's been nice. So I guess the, the, the question then is, you've obviously you mentioned earlier you've had a lot of firsts just in the nature of being on the pro tour and going to all these different events was that something when you were kind of getting involved I guess more in the professional aspects when you first broke through onto say national level and you started seeing I guess these um, dissimilarities these imbalances between the men's version of golf and the women's version of golf and the opportunities that existed was that something you thought hey in five years time when I finish university that'll be me I'm going to be doing that or is that something that you just kind of snowballed and, and changed over time never in a million years would I have expected that I'd have been able to compete at Augusta National um, or Saudi Arabia like these opportunities that we are starting to get are incredible um, the LET, the LPGA are doing such an amazing job of 
gathering people together, different sponsors, um, different organisations to try and help us increase the number of opportunities that we're getting. And they're doing a really, really great job. This year on the LET, we've got the biggest purse ever by like 5 million euros. Um, so that's, it's going to be such a great year and I'm really excited. Um, but there are still an awful lot of differences between the men's and the women's game. Um, I mean, the purse is uh, the first place that you start at, um, not even counting the early T because those purses in comparison to the LPGA are tiny as well. But yeah, an LPGA purse versus a men's purse, it's something like one twentieth of the size. Um, and that's a, it's, a, it's frustrating, but I can see it changing. Um, and so that's what's really exciting. And we can only look forward to the future of more and more events that are co-sanctioned with men's tours, um, where you're playing for equal prize money. Um, and I think the more people that actually watch us play, they'll realise that we're the most similar to what they can achieve. Um, a regular golfer is never going to be able to hit it 400 yards, but they can hit it 280, 290. Um, and that's what we're doing. So they can look at our game and learn from it, whereas they can't from the men's tour. Um, so, you know, just kind of getting that awareness out to everyone and the exposure to more sponsors, I think the, the women's game is just going to continue to grow. But well, that must be really exciting for you because I think very often you probably had people who went through their entire professional career as almost feeling like a bystander and not seeing any change take place. Whereas, you know, this isn't a unique discussion we're having. You're going, you're seeing events pop up in different sports, you know, whether it's tennis or swimming or whatever other sports are out there that where these new innovative leagues and competitions are popping up and saying 50-50 split and it's not even a discussion and you think, wow. That's amazing. But actually to be involved in that from an athlete point of view, that you must be every time these new ideas come up, you must be like, oh, I'd be really cool to get involved in that because you're literally at the, the front edge of anyone who's ever experienced it before. Absolutely. I've, I've turned pro at such a great time for women's sport in general. Um, you know, more companies are getting interested in sponsoring female events and it is becoming more of the norm for stuff to be 50-50. Um, we have an event this year that is sponsored by both Annika Sorensen and Henrik Stenson. Um, so you've got two kind of elite level professionals there co-sponsoring an event for equal prize money. I think we have three events on our schedule this year that are 50-50 with the men. That's unheard of. It's it's really, really exciting for our game. It's even more exciting to think that the next generation coming through won't see that as an issue. They would expect it yeah. being the norm, whereas obviously being... I remember watching the, the BBC footage of you, of you playing at Augusta and was thinking, I can't believe we're having this. Th th this is a thing in 2019. Because if it was happening in like most workplaces and stuff like that, there would be outrage about it. But in sport, it just seems to take so much longer to see change. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was an incredible experience. I never, ever thought that I'd get that opportunity. Um, and it all seemed to happen so quickly as well. I think they announced it in the February and the invitations went out almost instantly and we were playing the next year. That's so exciting. And that's it. it's so exciting to what comes next. And I guess there's a couple of things that I want to ask you before we look to, I guess, future stuff for both the sport and for yourself. Looking back, and obviously you're still really young and relatively early on in your pro career, but what, what kind of core messages have you picked up that are probably as applicable to golf as they are, to football as they are, to swimming or, or whatever it is? What kind of lessons from life have stuck out with you so far? Um, I think just to kind of always believe in yourself um, and kind of continue down your own journey. Not everyone's journey is going to end up the same way. You know, some people choose to stay in school. Some people choose to turn pro at a young age. Um, but just make every single decision with your final goal in mind and it'll all work out. Everything will always lead to that end point whether you know whether that particular one pulls off at the time or not it's okay because overall it will work out in the end that's a really nice positive thing and I guess then going forwards what are kind of your ambitions looking ahead both for the sport of golf and for yourself on this sporting journey 
Um, so got a really exciting year this year. Um, it's going to be a bit of a balance trying to stay between the Ladies European Tour and the Symmetra Tour, which is the one beneath the LPGA. Um, trying to earn some money over here, but at the same time, get some status on the LPGA Tour. So trying to balance those two is going to be important. But the, the overall goal is to get on the LPGA. Um, that's the dream to play in America. That's where the money is to, and all the best players in the world. So that's where I'd like to be. And I'm going to do everything I can this year to try and get myself onto that tour, whether it's next year or the year after. Um, but yeah, and then personally, I guess it's just to kind of enjoy the process. We've already said I've got a really exciting schedule plan for the year. Um, got a huge long list of countries that we're going to. So they kind of try and take a little bit of time while I'm in each of those to actually enjoy where I am. Brilliant. And they said one vinyl thing, cast your mind back to the, the seven-year-old, you know, missing that <laughs> first golf ball. What would you say to her if you could go back and give her one message? Just keep going. <laughs> Don't worry that you missed it. Don't dwell too long on the bad bits. Um, and just always try to take the positives. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time today, Alice. It's been really cool. And it's, I, so I remember it when you were still swimming. So it's really nice to have seen you kind of go through the whole American system, being on the pro circuit now and, and seeing where it goes next. Because like you said, it's a really exciting time. So thank you very much for your time today. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. I've really enjoyed it too. A huge thank you to Alice again there for such an insightful conversation. So many great points made and Alice's closing message there of just keep going and always trying to take the positives was such a great way to finish a positive interview. If you enjoyed that discussion, make sure you give Alice a follow on her social media and keep up to date as her journey continues onwards and upwards. Don't forget if you're not already on our social platforms to give us a quick follow too and our monthly update drops next week so make sure you're registered for that as we've got some exciting news to share about our up and coming season. All the links you'll need for those are in the show notes. Next week is the finale to season 6 and we speak to a former international junior surfer turned writer and explore both his journey and the journey of surfing from the counterculture routes that it has through to its Olympic debut this summer. Stay tuned for that. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Rogue Monkey podcast and have a great week. <laughs>